this project that Jennifer and I are, are working on, uh, we're very excited to, to be working on this project because it's, it's sort of crystallizing for us some thoughts that we've been sharing in non-written form for a very long time. Um, the, the paper um, takes a small slice of, of this um, project trying to bring together, you know, broaden the way in which we think about immigration law to encompass um, other forms of marginalization and in particular race and drawing connections to um, where the doctrinal origins of, of the immigration power, uh, you know, began in connection with uh, the law governing the U.S. territories and um, also federal Indian law, which is not a part of this paper, but also a very important piece of that story. Um, and for the purposes of this paper, uh, we want to take a look at the failure of the Supreme Court in its jurisprudence to directly acknowledge um, and engage the xenophobia and racism and colonialism that's embedded within its jurisprudence on immigration, uh, the constitutional power to regulate immigration, and uh, to govern the U.S. territories. And in the, in the paper, we use as a jumping off point a thought experiment um, that Addison Francois presents in a recent law review article where he invited readers to try to recall from memory or to identify through a word search, a majority opinion from the Supreme Court of the United States in which the justices speak plainly about white supremacy, its text, its subtext, its embodiments in civic and political institutions, its incarnations over time, the remnants of its tenets in daily life, the leavings of its creed in the national identity. Uh, spoiler, the pickings are rather slim. Um, Professor Francois identifies only really two plausible candidates in the Supreme Court's jurisprudence among majority opinions. You expand to dissent, you can find some others. Um, one is Loving versus Virginia, but really only because it actually uses the words white supremacy, not because it actually engages in any, in any deep, meaningful analysis. And the other one, which is also quite revealing, um, in District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, where Justice Scalia um, somewhat opportunistically provides uh, a partial discussion of historical instances in which black people have been denied the same right to armed self-defense um, that whites have enjoyed. But of course, they're begging the question, why is it relevant in that case and not in any number of others where uh, one could have engaged in that kind of analysis? So what we want to do in this project um, is t using that kind of... Um, uh, thought experiment as a jumping off point to think about an analogous pathology in the Supreme Court's case law on immigration and the territories. Um, you know, the racialized legacies of uh, territorial expansion, colonial rule, uh, and xenophobic immigration re restriction, of course, have left deep imprints on the court's jurisprudence, particularly in the 19th century. Um, and, uh, and yet, uh, in the contemporary case law, there is a central tendency to avoid engaging with any of that, uh, whether that's in aid of perpetuating um, the kind of marginalization that has existed in the past or in, uh, you know, softly resisting it in one form or another. Now, how precisely we plan to conceptualize the idea of legal memory or collective memory in this project, we need that, that is something that, you know, as a work in progress, we're still re, uh, refining. Um, one starting point for us, though, does come from uh, a recent paper by Kara Swanson, which is forthcoming in the Columbia Law Review, where she conceptualizes curated legal memory or curated collective legal memory as that which is provided in uh, you know, curated by law reviews, published cases, treatises, the content of law school classes, which is a memory that is both continuous and changeable, um, related to, but maybe distinct from what uh, would, some would refer to as the legal canon. Um, and, you know, what we are suggesting in this project, looking at a few discrete instances of recent cases, um, is a kind of legal forgetting uh, or legal erasure that is perpetuated in the Supreme Court's case law on both the territories and 
immigration of that xenophobic legacy and uh, restrictionist and colonialist legacy. Um, this project doesn't, as I mentioned, engage federal Indian law. A more complete project would, and we will certainly acknowledge that and perhaps try to find ways to ensure that we are not also perpetuating that erasure in that manner. Um, but you know, the, the official narratives that are pr provided in that kind, those kinds of legal constructed memory, those are not, you, you could define that more broadly, and I think we also want to be careful not to sort of engage in sort of a marginalization of where narratives come from, um, right? Uh, but official narratives by institutions like the Supreme Court, of course, do have some power, right? They're not the only official narratives that matter. I, I've been thinking this week about, I've been spending this semester at the University of California, Berkeley, um, and of course many of you will know that this week the UC Berkeley announced that they will be removing, they have in fact already removed the name Bolt from Bolt Hall, it's now just the law building, um, because of John Bolt's role in uh, being a forceful <laughs> advocate for Chinese exclusion. Um, and. You know, it's interesting to, you know, Berkeley is not alone. Uh, some of the, the, the leading exponents of the discourse underlying the Supreme Court's case law on the territories, the insular cases, are prominently celebrated uh, met former, met, you know, longtime members of the Harvard and Yale Law School faculties, right, whose names are similarly emblazoned on buildings and in named chairs. Um, but, you know, it's interesting as I think about the Berkeley experience, um, sometimes as we are remembering, we are also forgetting, right? So to take a selection of statements made by Berkeley's leadership this week, right? Um, the chancellor. In 2017, it came to light that Bolt Hall's namesake, John Henry Bolt, was a leading figure in the Chinese uh, exclusion movement in 2017. The dean, in spring 2017, it was learned <laughs> that John Bolt was a strong supporter of the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, the official UC press release. The outcome of a nearly three-year process launched after a Berkeley dis lecturer discovered the racist writings of John Henry Bolt. And of course, this is a partial, right, when we speak of forgetting and um, amnesia, that's not quite precise because, of course, all along there are people who have been remembering and re-remembering and disseminating, right? The things that we'll talk about in this paper are not unknown. Um, but, and yet, when the Supreme Court constructs its official narratives, there is a kind of erasure and forgetting that is taking place at the same time. Um, so uh, I'll turn to Jennifer to talk uh, about the territories cases that we're looking at and then um, I'll come back and talk about some of the immigration examples from the, the current case, and we welcome then, uh, we'll start to talk about the prescriptive questions that we were thinking about. Right, so I think in, in this first section of the paper, which is not written yet, um, <laughs> but is in many ways written because it's not, um, it, we're not the first to come here, um, we want to explore the way in which 19th century case law governing the territories and immigration are explicitly premised on racism and endorsement of the legitimacy of colonial rule over, you know, over people that are characterized as quote unquote savage, right? That, that all of that is there um, in the law, very explicitly in the law. And that you can draw a straight line uh, from there to the contemporary cases. And so what we do in the second section of the paper, which um, we have more of a, an elaboration on now, is look at some very recent cases um, where there's a, an opportunity um, to take this on, head on, and where the court just doesn't. Um, and we want to sort of explicate that. And so um, one of the examples that we are um, drawing on is, uh, is the recent case involving PROMESA, uh, uh, the legislation about the restructuring of Puerto Rican debt. Um, so that's Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico versus Aurelius Investment LLC. Um, and we will also consider some immigration cases, um, and Anil will talk specifically about Hawaii versus Trump uh, today. We, uh, we uh, could also here consider some of the recent Guantanamo litigation. We can consider the citizenship case uh, involving American Samoa. There are lots of particularly interesting cases right now uh, that sort of tee these questions up. Um, but uh, but the 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 I'll, I'll focus right now on on the um, the case involving Promesa. Um, uh, uh, the what we find here is uh, a kind of what, if we're thinking about what's happening here. Uh, we clearly have uh, colonial usurpation of territorial autonomy and authority by Congress uh, while coordinating, uh, while the coordinate branches of governments pretend that's not what's happening, right? So that's what's going on, right? We have, we have an assertion uh, by Congress about uh, sort of imposing uh, a sort of 
viceroy style structure that will that will tell Puerto Rico uh, how to fix its debt problems. Um, and, uh, and it's styled as if it's governing uh, through the territorial government, um, but it is in fact supplanting uh, the government. Um, and so the plaintiffs challenging the statute have brought their challenges under the rubric of the appointments clause. Um, so they say this presidentially appointed oversight board uh, created uh, by the act uh, by, by, the, uh, by the act of Congress is, uh, is constitutionally illegitimate because uh, it is the, the individuals who are members of this board are not uh, properly appointed. Um, and it's important to note uh, that if we look at the statute, the territorial government of Puerto Rico is subordinated to the board uh, by the statute. It clarifies that neither the government nor the legislator of Puerto Rico can exercise control over or impair the functions of this board. Um, so although it's structured as an entity, uh, although kind of the, the government is arguing that it operates within the territorial government, it is actually, uh, it supersedes uh, the territorial government. Um, and the First Circuit uh, opinion makes it clear that the board is vested with enormous discretionary power in the supervision of Puerto Rico's fiscal affairs. Um, so Title III creates a broad bankruptcy safe haven that covers the territories and its subordinate instrumentalities, but it makes the board the sole representative of the territories in those bankruptcy proceedings. Um, uh, so we have this challenge. Um, the plaintiffs are Aurelius Investment LLC uh, and then a union, um, UTIER, which is the Puerto Rican labor organization that represents employees of, gov of the government-owned electric power company. So there's this unholy alliance uh, between labor and capital that, and that probably begs some, <laughs> some interrogation of its own. But the argument here is that uh, the board here is, is, is comprised of officers of the United States and therefore should have been appointed in a particular way as specified in the appointments clause. Um, and they haven't been uh, confirmed by the Senate, so the plaintiffs argue that there's a constitutional violation here. The board members argue in response that they're not principal officers of the United States because they're responsible for purely local matters, um, but they also have made the argument that the Appointments Clause doesn't even apply to, board, to the board in this case because uh, they exercise authority in Puerto Rico at a, quote, unincorporated territory where the territorial clause endows Congress with plenary power. So, uh, so there are two layers to the argument, right? One is sort of a pure Appointments Clause style argument. Uh, about whether or not the Appointments Clause pertains to the board. Um, but there's a second layer to this, which is whether or not the Appointments Clause matters at all um, in the governance of, uh, of Puerto Rico. Um, so the First Circuit concluded that the board was governed by the Appointments Clause, and board members were officers of the United States, and that the appointment without Senate confirmation uh, therefore violates the Constitution. Um, in this way, they, the First Circuit um, engages in a narrow reading of the Territorial Clause, um, and says they're not going to uh, they're not going to uh, accept the premise that the territorial clause displaces the appointments clause, uh, but they're also not going to go uh, to a place where they don't feel empowered to go, which is to declare uh, the sort of underlying broad superstructure the territories clause is interpreted through the insular cases as unconstitutional. So obviously the, the hands of the First Circuit are somewhat tied um, in overruling Supreme Court precedent in this way, but the Supreme Court presumably does have latitude to engage this question uh, head on, um, and in fact an oral argument. Before the Supreme Court, counsel for the union, Uthier, urged the Supreme Court to overrule the insular cases. She argued that the cases were a dark cloud over the entire matter um, and that they were, quote, grounded in ideas of alien races uh, and savage people um, that wrought a constitutional injury on the party that she represented uh, and that this was something that required judicial remedy. And you could see immediately judicial resistance to the idea of going down this road of overruling the insular cases. Um, so Justice Breyer agreed um, in, in Breyer fashion, uh, that this was indeed a dark cloud, but he says, uh, quote, it doesn't matter here because the provision of the Constitution doesn't apply, i.e., we can decide this on appointments clause ground without getting into the whole sad <laughs> saga of the insular cases. Justice Roberts summarized the controversy as limited to the appointments clause and, quote, I just don't see, he said, the pertinence of the insular cases. Right, so it, it's what 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 relevance could they possibly have to a case that involves this huge usurpation of, gov of governmental power in Puerto Rico? Um, the refusal of the court to grapple with this ongoing constitutional problem created by the insular cases is akin to the use of constitutional submergence that we'll see in the uh, the immigration cases. And Anil's going to talk a little bit about Trump versus Hawaii right now. Um, so we see huge. Um, 
pushback from commentators about how this is clearly out of step um, with jurisprudence in other areas. It ignores um, the changes to law um, that have happened in the mid 20th century um, that, that sort of uh, at least uh, purport to favor some notions of an equality principle. Um, it just bypasses them. So you have a direct through line from the late 19th century to now um, without any sort of uh, deviations or, uh, or, or moves away um, from these sort of unequal doctrines. Um, and what's interesting about the argument in the Insler cases is you see the court's squeamishness about, about revisiting any of this, about taking it head on, about, uh, about overruling it. Um, and it was contrasted really nicely by counsel um, for the union, again, um, with the court's willingness uh, to overturn, in whatever form or fashion it did, Korematsu um, in uh, Trump versus Hawaii. Um, so in, you might remember there's a sort of late-breaking, off-handed paragraph in Chief Justice Roberts' opinion for the court in Trump versus Hawaii that purports to um, overrule um, uh, uh, Korematsu, um, it is unnecessary for the holding, and uh, and we would maintain probably at odds uh, with the holding <laughs> in Trump versus Hawaii. But but they do it, um, and the willingness of the court to overrule Korematsu in the context of that case, um, cementing sweeping executive power to discriminate to, to discriminate um, in, in immigration exclusion, plays side by side with the court's complete unwillingness to revisit or even think about revisiting the racist insular cases when those cases are squarely implicated in the legal architecture that gives rise to promesa, reveals how constitutional submergence is a deliberate strategic choice that the court is engaging in, and one that operates in service of the court's unwillingness to grapple with the realities of a racist colonial past. Um, so I think that, with that, I'll turn it over to you to talk about the immigration um, cases. Yeah, so we could pick a number of different examples from the immigration context that are analogous, where the court is avoiding engaging the uh, traditional doctrines of, of, of deference. Um, and non-reviewability. But I do want to talk about Trump versus Hawaii, um, uh, in part because of the way in which it's used in the PROMESA case, um, and in part because it sort of, you know, really sharply illustrates the forgetting that I think we're trying to point to in a profound way, right? So Trump versus Hawaii, there's no reference to um, uh, the sources of authority, the Chinese exclusion uh, cases from the 19th century, nowhere mentioned, right? And even as they the cases that develop out of that and are more whitewashed are, in fact, relied upon. Uh, even recent history is erased. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts starts his opinion. The narrative starts uh, in January uh, 2017. Um, and uh, with the third executive order um, uh, excluding Muslims, not with the full narrative of where those uh, orders came from. Uh, you know, Donald Trump on the campaign trail promising a complete and, to and total shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. When he does get around to talking about the origins of the Muslim ban, it's something like 27 pages into a 32-page opinion, um, and in somewhat desultory fashion. Right, uh, sort of with these kind of hemming and hawing around what is really at stake in the arguments that are squarely being presented by the challengers to uh, the, the Trump exclusion orders. Um, and then there is, of course, the weird role played by Korematsu versus United States in this opinion um, uh, on page 32 of 32. Um, it's not an affirmative mention of Korematsu. It is uh, a response to Justice Sotomayor, who uh, I, uh, has the temerity to say um, that today's holding is all the more troubling given the stark parallels between the reasoning of this case and that of Korematsu, which she then proceeds to elaborate. Um, the, the language, which Jennifer pointed to um, in Justice, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, is palpably angry at this being raised, right? It's almost like a triggering of fragility. Um, to use another sort of conceptual uh, way of thinking about race, right? Is it, uh, uh, to draw from the, the work on uh, Robin D'Angelo on white fragility, right? Um, where he says, well, whatever rhetorical advantage the dissent sees, um, uh, Korematsu has nothing to do with this case, right? Uh, query whether one should say anything further if that's true. Um, uh, but Chief Justice Roberts goes on to say, the forcible relocation of US citizens to concentration camps solely and explicitly on the basis of race is objectively unlawful and outside the scope of presidential authority. 
Um, but it is wholly inapt to liken that morally repugnant order to a facially neutral policy denying certain foreign nationals the privilege of admission. Um, the entry suspension, suspension is an act that is well within executive authority and could have been taken by any other president. The only question is evaluating the actions of this particular president promulgating an otherwise valid proclamation. The dissent's reference to Korematsu, however, affords this court the opportunity to make express what is already obvious. Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided, has been overruled in the court of history, and to be clear, has no place in the law under the Constitution, right? This was praised. This language, of course, as you, you, all of us have read, right? Um, critics of the exclusion orders, critics of this decision went out of their way to praise uh, this, um, uh, on its own terms, irrelevant dicta about Korematsu, um, which is, you know, therefore logically inconsistent. But it also presents a distorted picture of history. And I want to emphasize this as a way of tying it to the, um, the, the broader project here. Um, it is true that the cases that made it to the Supreme Court challenging the removal and incarceration regime during World War II involved US citizens, right? But 35% of the people who were incarcerated were non-citizens, right? This is part of the immigration history of the United States. And the, the, it's, it's not, so, so there's a distortion of history and a sort of reading out, right? Sometimes when we are remembering, we are also forgetting. Right, so, so here's another example, and, and we can talk about other examples if folks are interested about the ways in which this erasure takes place. And I think we're over time, so I just want to say a, a lot of this is doctrinal analysis that sounds more in TRS than TWAIL, I think, but part of what we're trying to do is demonstrate how international law is embedded in the U.S. racial um, construction project, um, particularly as embodied in its immigration jurisprudence. And then there's a trapped in amber quality to the embedded international law in the domestic law um, treatment of it that then um, sort of uh, <laughs> kind of uh, travels outward, um, so from immigration jurisprudence elsewhere, um, and creates a sort of sticky anchor for colonial racism in the international law frame as well. So I think that's how we want to bring it into conversation with the broader project of this symposium. Um, and I think we need to be attentive as we're doing so to uh, the court um, without being unduly uh, guilty of centering the US Supreme Court um, in analyzing the present moment and searching for paths forward. So we welcome cr critique and criticism and guidance on that, uh, on that um, kind of that caveat point. Um, and I'll close there. Chantal. Okay, thank you, um, and good afternoon, everyone. And um, it is amazing to be back here in this space um, within a year. So, really, kudos to the organizers who have so brilliantly put this together. Um, uh, and uh, you know, as I was saying to one of the editors um, in the hallway just now, it's so it's so crucial to actually create the physical space in which these conversations can occur. And I'm interested in my scholarship um, in practices of knowledge production, so I know that as, a, as an historical fact. And so creating these kinds of opportunities for people to engage is really what allows our knowledge to advance. So I um, just express my gratitude again to all the faculty and the students who, and the staff who, who made this uh, possible. Okay, so I think I've used up five of my 12 minutes now, but. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, into the international law space, and where the whole point of this, you know, conversation is to think about various uh, mutual implications between the two planes. Um, but uh, this is building on that presentation that I initially made um, uh, a year ago now um, in the initial version of this um, this conversation. Um, which wanted to look at the connections between race, migration, and global political economy and how they connect in particular in international law, exploring uh, three propositions. First, economic migration is a function of global inequality. Second, racial formations have crucially shaped the landscape of global inequality. And third, the social and legal construct of racial difference 
in its myriad and shifting manifestations and sometimes contradictions, gaps, contradictions, and ambiguities, has played a central role in shaping the international order through which people move in search of economic opportunity. So then I was developing the, the piece and presenting it, proposing it to this symposium, and realized that I wanted to think more about both of these aspects in connection with each other, so not just migration, but the economic inequality that forms the precursor for migration. So now, this piece is even more broad, um, and the title is Race, Law, and Global Political Economy. And so it's a thought piece about racial hierarchy in law and political economy, and in particular, how they manifest in international law and global governance. And so the project is to think about how we understand racialization as part of the process by which institutions of economic hierarchy not only were created but continue to be legitimated. Um, so the paper has three sections. The first is a literature review because one can't enter into this conversation without acknowledging and building on incorporating all of the incredibly brilliant work that's gone before. Um, and then I focus on a couple of sectors in global political economy, so in particular commodity production and labor migration. And then finally, I think about um, the concept of technology and racialization as a technology of global economic governance. So I'll try to quickly go through um, some of the observations I make in those three sections. So um, in the first section, looking at literatures um, on racial hierarchy in global political economy, looking at literatures that occur both situated in the United States and situated in, from the post-colonial perspective. Um, so the genealogies um, that many have, have uh, been discussing today are, are really crucial, including the relationship between critical race theory and third world approaches to international law. So I won't say more about, about that, um, so much as has been said already of value, so I don't, I don't know that I could add to it. Um, I will, I do want to, though, give a shout out to Michael's um, idea of the oral history. So again, thinking about kind of practices of knowledge production, I totally agree with that. I think that would be an amazing project to do an oral history and talk to folks. Um, at various moments during the anti-apartheid movement, you know, who, who, we still have people who you know, were in the UN General Assembly and in the related institutions during the time of decolonization in the new international economic order. George Abisab is still around, but you know, it's the, it would be amazing to do that. So if anybody is interested, <laughs> you know, um, you know, email me. Um, um, so, so that, those literatures, um, and then also looking at literatures and economics and economic history, um, so clearly we're, many of us are returning to literature on racial capitalism, um, and just to highlight that the, the crucial point that, um, that the work of Cedric Robinson building on so many others, W.B. Du Bois, um, C.L.R. James, um, and, and many others, um, internationally, um, M.A. Cesaire, Stuart Hall, Paul Gilroy, um, so many, many others who were in this space. Uh, but breaking out of uh, an idea of thinking about whether um, slavery is a product of chattel slavery as it occurred in the United States was a product of, of racism that caused slavery, or was it capitalistic greed that, that created uh, slavery that then produced racialization? So, there's a kind of this classic um, debate and, and very simplifying debate, and Robinson's work shows that it was really neither, but that um, capitalism flowed through these discourses of racialism that had already existed, and so it was organic to um, um, the sort of co-constitute each other. Right? So slavery is an organic. Um, product of capitalism as one among a wide variety of various forms of labor coercion that would include indentured servitude and waged labor. Um, and that's a rebuke um, not only of the dominant conception and celebration of capitalism as a kind of end of history formation or a manifestation of you know, classic values of liberalism and universalism, but it's also a rebuke to the sort of traditional left position, the sort of classical Marxist position that capitalism is 
a fundamental break from practices of feudalism and other mode, pre-capitalist modes of socioeconomic organization that, of course, it builds on, it builds on, um, on those and, and very much reflects. We, we still live with uh, feudal and, and post-feudal right, forms of economic production and social organization. Um, so I go into that a bit and then look at dependency theory um, and the set of critiques with decolonization, looked at how practices of empire maintained economic inequality. And here, a kind of a similar observation that, um, that rather than looking at the sort of developed world and the developing world as, um, as being organized across, uh, uh, along a kind of an evolutionary spectrum, in which you know, the advanced economies had just had this set of inherent qualities um, and the other economies had this other backward set of qualities that what you see in the developing world is a product of the colonial encounter so that in many cases, um, as Walter Runney put it, Europe underdevelops other parts of the world. Um, and so what looks like, what might look to the untrained eye, like a set of sort of backward social formations is, is crucially part of the colonial encounter. Um, okay, so despite all the differences uh, in focus of all of these different theorists, they're all looking to show how um, a population once formally excluded from a putatively universal and liberal legal system and relegated to a formally separate and subordinate system, non-whites in the US uh, and other metropoles of the center, uh, third world states in the international interstate community have been failed by a subsequent formal inclusion that ignored <clears throat> deep-rooted structural inequities. Um, and they show how formal and identity-based differentiation provides the backdrop for early formations of capitalism and colonialism that continue to generate effects today, even as those formal differentiations have been at least partially uh, rejected. Um, uh, okay, um, to the, so the analysis then is looking at both historical and contemporary formations. So again, here, rejecting the notion that the inequality that we're seeing today is a product of, and it's an unfortunate legacy of practices that occurred in the distant past, but that racial markers continue to provide explanatory power for how and why contemporary practices of suppression, subordination, and dispossession reinforce and perpetuate those historical inequalities. So with that as a kind of a framework, I then turn to an analysis of key sectors in the global political economy and ask in the international law context, what is the connection between the law's co-constitution of racialization and global economic inequality, both in historical formations and in contemporary manifestations? So in this section, I'm looking at um, international legal norms that shape global economic governance, how they reinforce inequality, and how that illuminates the dynamic of racialization. And so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here. I look at international economic law on, um, that sets out uh, rules in, on trade in agriculture, and I look at labor migration, and basically look at how the presumptive norms in each of these areas of uh, international law create this internally contradictory dynamic of open markets but closed borders. So both the ideal of liberalization and non-discrimination in international economic law and its effects on economic production on the one hand, so open markets, and the ideal of sovereign uh, prerogative over territorial entry of non-citizens and its effects on labor migration, uh, closed borders, that you have this in internal contradiction that reinforces global inequities that are the product of racialized power. Uh, so the, um, here I'm looking not just at the history in which explicit racialization and racial formations form the basis for the organization of these patterns of production and movement, but also the way in which the contemporary rules track um, and have their own sets of gaps, contradictions, and ambiguities that reveal or, and, and reinforce that underlying um, dynamic. Um, okay, um, so he, this is where I started to think about race as a technology of global economic governance. And so I had this one 
kind of sentence actually in my thing last year that racial formation has constituted a technology of global economic governance, a marker for sorting the distribution of hierarchy, um, the distribution and hierarchy of economic entitlements. And so here I try to develop what that means. So what the concept of technology is and how it might add explanatory power, how it adds to the notion of social construction because it incorporates a role for strategic decision making, for expertise and for knowledge. So this concept of technology is it it's, has a broader scope than the way the term is deployed, for example, in Radhika Mungia's uh, brilliant work on uh, the passport as a technology for regulating migration, where she's looking at the passport as a sort of an artifact and as a mode of administrative practice, and that's reflecting this important insight that the enforcement of even a foundational concept like sovereign rule depends on the existence of this wide range of capacities, so the enforcement of border control actually depends on the existence of mechanisms of governance that can detect valid and invalid entries um, and can mobilize resources of coercion to effectuate exclusionary policy. But those practices themselves have to be politically and ethically justified, and it's here that the scripts of nation and the partially subtextual scripts of race and ethnicity do their work. So as Mungia says, the passport is one concrete technology that harnesses this strategy to produce the nationalized migrant body. And here, I think about the term as going beyond the analysis of the concrete artifact, but to refer to these larger strategies, to, these, to the set of knowledge practices involved in the construction, legitimation, and enforcement of social categories um, and so race as a technology is about racialization as a technology. And I think here, are at least partially influenced by some of some pretty foundational work in development economics, um, including the, um, the, the literature on new institutional economics, in which economists like Douglas North talk about institutions as being really key to economic development and explain essentially Western economic growth as a product of good institutions. And North is very clear that by institutions, he means not just you know, concrete organizations, but norms, rules of the game. Um, and so, of course, he's talking about the sort of the classic narrative of freedom of contract and sort of principles of, of liberalism in both politics and economics. But here I would suggest that those narratives and those norms include very substantially and centrally the, the dynamic of racialization and racial hierarchy and white supremacy. So it's sort of a mirror image to the story that new institutional economics might tell about the history of Western development. Um, so we can think about race or racializa racialization as a technology of, of empirical knowledge, so how knowledge gets constructed about the natural world, so human biology, and all of the attendant forms of knowledge um, and academic discipline that uh, accompanied colonial expansion, um, so geography, anthropology, um, et cetera, that are supporting this master discourse of racial difference. Um, in addition to a technology of empirics, a technology of legal rule. So, of course, the reinforcement of racialized difference has been has been pointed out multiple times today. Depends on this very complex organization of of governance. Um, uh, and then finally, as a technology of economic production. So here is where we get to the notion of race as a marker for sorting the distribution and the hierarchy of economic entitlement. So where you sit in the chain of production and consumption, forced labor versus indentured servitude, raw materials versus industrialized, industrialized products, and so on. Um, so um, to conclude, <laughs> the argument is that racialization and political economy is a social phenomenon of enormous significance that technologies of empirics, legal rule, and economic production have served to establish and entrench these hierarchies and have shaped at various levels the um, uh, contemporary global economic governance. <clears throat> and the project of unco uncovering and articulating those dynamics has been shared across a range of scholarly disciplines. 
and I see our contributions today as very much contributing to that ongoing project. So I'll stop there. I just want to quickly add my thanks um, to the faculty who organize, bring you know, brought, bring bring together this amazing community. Many of us probably do feel like exiles within you know the legal world, and it's really lovely to be um, in conversation with with everyone here. Thanks also to the student organizers um, who've done just an amazing job, and and again, I feel really lucky to be here. Um, it's hard to see, yeah, it's up there, okay. Uh, so in January to, of 2017, in one of his first acts as president, Donald Trump signed an executive order authorizing the construction of a wall along the southern border of the United States. The proposed wall would cut across the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham, bisecting their reservation, which straddled, has straddled the U.S.-Mexico border for more than a century. At the end of the Mexican-American War, uh, in 1848, when the United States seized nearly two-thirds of Mexico, the international boundary line was drawn above the Gila River, just, above, just north of, of autumn lands. But a few years later, with the Gadsden Purchase, the United States and Mexico shifted the international boundary line again, dividing autumn land and peoples. The autumn themselves, of course, were never consulted about the division. The Gadsden Purchase had little immediate uh, effect on the lives of the autumn, but since the late 19th century, the tribe has lost territory on both sides of the border to settler encroachment, to railroad construction, to ranching, mining, other extractive industries. Since the 1990s, autumn land has become the site of intensified border enforcement. Members of the tribes are routinely stopped by border patrol. Some have been returned to Mexico, though they are US citizens, enrolled in federally recognized tribes. Uh, in 2006, the Border Patrol installed gated barriers across the reservation, and these gates open regularly for family reunions and celebrations, but for the autumn, the barriers stand in the way of exercising a natural freedom, a freedom of movement that predates colonialism and the nation state. Nicholas de Geneva has used the term autonomy of movement to recognize the self-authorizing and deeply po political capacity or capacity for movement exercised outside of and independently of the contemporary nation state system. For millennia, movement and migration have been essential to autumn survival in an arid desert, essential to trade with adjacent tribes and maintaining flexibility in the face of political displacement and uh, ecological disruption. The autumn have survived the cle cleaving of their land and community for more than 150 years. The proposed border wall represents only the most recent violation in a continuous, unbroken history of colonial conquest. Until recently, it had become commonplace to suggest that the only things that liberal, uh, the only thing that liberals and conservatives can agree upon with respect to our immigration system is that it's broken. And talk of fixing it has been limited by a framework of compromise, one that trades regularization of certain desirable immigrants for heightened enforcement and further restriction of future streams of, of migration, a uh, neoliberal kind of reform. Uh, but in the few years since he announced his campaign for office, Donald Trump has radically reframed the immigration debate, recasting it in explicitly paranoid terms of white nationalism, characterizing immigrants as invaders, insinuating that they threaten not only the physical security of white Americans, but the survival of the nation itself. Since taking office, the Trump administration <coughs> has implemented a series of viciously anti-immigrant policies, testing the norms of polite discourse and legal constraint, often leaving his critics bewildered at the apparent weakness of our, uh, of our public norms and the apparent incapacity of our institutions to constrain the president, particularly in his dealing with, dealings with immigrant non-citizens. The Muslim ban, the separation of parents and children, propose, proposals to end birthright citizenship, all of these have been, dem have been met with demonstrations of liberal outrage. That outrage, however genuinely felt, has failed to give rise to either a sustained critique of our current immigration system or a meaningful alternative to it. And it's that failure of liberal imagination that my contribution seeks to address. So in the past couple of years, a number of writers have attempted to trace the origins of white nationalism to earlier moments in American history. Uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr., for instance, locates it in the redemption or the reassertion of white supremacy after, after Reconstruction. Others trace the fear of white genocide and racial replacement to back to the eugenics movement and native, nativist policies of the early, early 20th century. Others identify the resurgence of global white nationalism with its 
uh, emergence a century ago in what W.E.B. Du Bois, who's come up a number of times today, uh, recognized to be a response to anti-colonial movements on the one hand and mass migration from the colonized peripheries to white metropoles on the other. And in this paper, I want to argue that white nationalism has its roots in the soil itself, of course, in the very construction and composition of the United States, a state founded in conquest, shaped by histories of territorial expansion, native elimination, racial slavery, and as Zizrana pointed out, unilateral exercise of economic and military power abroad, as well as immigration policies that have tended to encourage or facilitate white, mi white settlement on the one hand while controlling race to migration and social mobility on the other. White nationalism, in other words, is not a corruption of an otherwise respectable immigration discourse or policy. Instead, immigration policy has played an integral role in creating and maintaining a racial state, which is itself the source of, of a contemporary white nationalism. In other words, again, white nationalism is bound up with the border itself. My paper then seeks to intervene in legal and public debates by asserting first that if we're to imagine a meaningful alternative to our current immigration regime, then liberal or progressive Americans have to be willing to confront white nationalism, its relationship to settler colonialism, colonial capitalism, and border, bordering practices. And second, recognizing that white nationalism has its roots in settler colonialism, my, per, my paper urges us to, to sort of press beyond the nation state framework within which questions about immigration law and policy are often framed and replace it with a temporally and spatially expanded framework of settler em, uh, empire to invoke, again, Rana's enormously useful term. Uh, in scholarship and public debates about immigration, we often take for granted the normative con and conceptual priority of national borders as the borders came first and migration second. But national borders, the contemporary nation state form, the international system of nation states are rel relatively recent formations, settled in the aftermath of world war, the closing of new world frontiers, the collapse of European empires, and the clamoring for post-colonial independence. And in the United States, which I'm interested in thinking about a little bit more carefully, I think the autumn remind us that there's nothing natural or inevitable about either the United States contemporary borders, nor its power to restrict movement across the borders. Across borders. <clears throat> their presence reminds us not only of, the prior, of their prior and persistent claim to lands now situated within the United States, but also the priority of their claim to move freely across those same lands. Part of my paper then is an attempt to is an attempt to remap the crisis. And so the language of crisis is often used to refer to the flow of unauthorized migrants across the US southern border. It's, the word crisis is sometimes used to refer to the senseless suffering endured by migrants forced to flee their circumstances. But more often, I think, it's really used to refer to a loss of control over the border or a loss of control over unruly others. The crisis, in other words, is really a crisis of state control. The problem with unauthorized migration is not that it threatens national security, as Trump has vaguely asserted and as the Supreme Court has long maintained. Instead, the problem with unauthorized migration is that it confronts us with the essential fragility or the essential instability of the contemporary nation state system, which as Hannah Arendt anticipated at the time of its con consolidation, would itself become the cause of unprecedented homelessness in the world. Unauthorized migration exposes the violence that settler democracies like the United States and Australia are prepared to unleash upon their most vulnerable neighbors to de defend their national identity and independence. Uh, as Aileen Moreton Robinson reminds us, quote, it takes a great deal of work to maintain the United States and Australia, uh, those societies founded as settler uh, colonies, it takes a great deal of work to maintain them as modern nation states. The United States maintains its white, itself as a white possession by perpetuating indigenous dispossession. It maintains its exclusive sovereignty by denying indigenous sovereignty. And they maintain their essential whiteness in the United States within a, a continent that was once inhabited exclusively by non-white people by enforcing its borders and denying others mobility, uh, overwhelmingly indigenous peoples. In much of the post-colonial, in much of post-colonial Asia and Africa, the nation-state is often felt to be an ill-fitting imposition, reflecting the experience and preoccupation of former colonizers rather than the desires of the once colonized. In the United States, the nation-state form, as that imagined unity of people, place, and government, is further complicated by the United States settler imperial history. 
So part of the, uh, in part of the paper, then, I attempt to denaturalize or unsettle the apparent fixity of US borders by recalling histories of continental conquest and overseas expansion, processes that have, in, uh, that have involved the continuous redrawing of territorial boundaries, as well as demographic boundaries, as, as others have, have already mentioned. Paul Freimer reminds us the nation's appetite for territorial expansion has been limited only by racism. Uh, after the Mexican-American War, for instance, though the United States could have seized more land, it took to the unsettled half into which the U.S. could introduce an American population, avoiding incorporation of non non-white mestizo and indigenous populations. As Laura Gomez, who was here earlier but is gone, uh, has demonstrated the United States refused to incorporate non-white peoples as self-governing cit citizens deferring statehood to the new Mexican territory well into the 20th century. Uh, by contrast, as Rana has shown, European immigrants were often encouraged to settle with land grants, voting rights, among other inducements. And it's worth recognizing that settler colonialism and nation building has involved not just racial, racial selection, but racial expulsion, periodic racial expulsion. So legal histories that tend to focus on the legislative means of, of racial exclusion sometimes obscure the role that brute violence has played in securing the United States as a white possession. Um, it's perhaps no accident that the euphemism now used to refer to the deportation of immigrants, removal, is the same euphemism that was used to refer to the expulsion of indigenous Americans. And that pattern of racial removal is one that has appeared as, as a strategy for eliminating indigenous people from the continent as well as overseas territory, which is what um, this slide shows. And it has been a consistent strategy for uh, dealing with other racialized groups, from African Americans subject to varieties of forced migration and confinement, to Chinese and Indian immigrants purged from cities across the Pacific Northwest in campaigns of coordinated violence, uh, to Mexicans aggressively recruited to work on farms and factories during periods of economic boom, and then forced to repatriate during times of bust. Of course, the United States has never been contained by its own borders. Uh, the United States has never been contained by its own borders, economically, politically, or otherwise. The War of Independence was, in large part, fought to transgress an imperial boundary drawn to prevent settlers from claiming Indian land. Uh, the United States has expanded and contracted its overseas empire a number of ways, a number of times since the early 20th century, and it maintains an archipelago uh, of military bases around the world, stretching the physical reach and conceptual plausibility of territorial limits or boundaries. So resituating immigration within a spatially expanded terrain of settler imperialism, I think, allows us to bring into a single field of analysis the relationship between immigration and empire or the unilateral assertion of economic and military power beyond its borders. That's, that's sort of what I mean by, by empire. Um, and particularly within the Western Hemisphere. In his 2012 documentary uh, called Harvest of Empire, based on a book by the same title, Juan Gonzalez traces major migrations from central uh, from several countries in the Caribbean and Central America to a history of U.S. intervention with which m many of us are familiar, formal uh, domination or occupation in some instances, as in Puerto Rico and Cuba, but in more recent histories, informal or, or covert intervention, as in Guatemala, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. The documentary, if you've seen it, is exhausting in the way that in which it plods through the history of one country after another. Uh, the story of U.S. aggression remains constant, though the, the, the sort of um, particulars within each nation change. But over the course of the film, the grid of nation states that organizes the, the narrative begins to give way to another picture, one of a centuries long hemispheric war. And it's within that context that I want us to sort of resituate um, the border conflict. So I want to conclude with just one final image. In the days <coughs> leading up to the midterm elections, the president sought to drum up uh, support for conservative candidates by promising to defend the United States against a migrant invasion. As a caravan of migrants, overwhelmingly asylum seekers from Central America, overwhelming indigenous peoples, made its way through Mexico. The president sent armed guards to the border at one point, suggesting he might even order uh, uh, guards to shoot. The president's op opponents, meanwhile, had very little to say in response, insisting on changing the conversation to um, health care. Um, but if we were to widen our frame a bit, we would recognize that, in fact, it's not the immigrant who is the invader, it's the settler. It's, uh, it's the settler um, who 
as you know, as in a Hollywood Western a, a reference in the in the in the paper, the settler so finds himself surrounded by natives, but it's the settler who presents the danger to the natives and not the other way around. It's the settler rather than the native who invades, and it's his own act of invasion that occasions his terror, which he, uses, which he then uses to justify catastrophic violence uh, he inflicts upon others. The migrant then, I think, presents us with an ethical challenge to recognize what is human or sacred in the other. And by failing to meet that ethical challenge, we also miss an opportunity for epistemic correction. The caravan challenges us to see things differently to unsettle the settler's self-image. And it also, uh, we also miss an opportunity to imagine an alternative order, right? One within which the, the unauthorized migrant is a self-authorized migrant who presents um, who presents us with, uh, with a way of imagining an, alter an alternative geography, to use you know, language that was already offered, um, premise not on a kind of border imperialism, but a relationality, reciprocity, and interdependence. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you to the organizers, the students, everyone put this together. It's great. Thank you for my co-panelists here and all during the day. I, I've just been super shocked by the how smart all the presentations and papers all day long have been. They're not always this good from beginning <laughs> till right there. Maybe this, this is where it is. Um, OK, so my, my project begins an encounter with what we could call a conventional historical narrative. So let me run quickly through that, that conventional historical narrative. It begins after the Napoleonic Wars, after the end of the Congress of Vienna, after the Concert of Europe comes into being, and over the decades in the middle part of the 19th century, a standard of civilization comes into fashion, the purpose of which, as we know, is to separate out the uncivilized, the backward peoples from those rights-bearing members of the family of nations. As we move past the high peaks of the standard civilization by the time we get into the 1880s and then into the early decades of the 20th century and we meet the Hague Peace Conferences, we come to the League of Nations, we come to the United Nations in a mainstream version of this historical narrative, the standard civilization is fading and it's about to disappear entirely. There are going to be problems for sure. But that vulgar standard civilization, for whatever it was, it was religious, it was cultural, it was sure, it was racist, but I don't really know exactly what it was. It was too amorphous. Whatever it was, it's going away now as we make our way into the League of Nations. The mandate system is surely an improvement, warts and all. The United Nations is an improvement further still, despite the veto and other kinds of difficulties. Right, but this is, a, this is a story of progress. Now, in a familiar, though not quite mainstream version of that same moment, the standard civilization didn't disappear or fade, it transformed. And it transformed in such a way as to give rise to a, a series or phases of economic exploitation, right, as we enter the law and development game, or perhaps it's a different kind of cultural domination, yet somehow different now after the move to institutions. The standard didn't disappear, it transformed, it changed, but still in this familiar, though not mainstream version of the historical narrative, it's not a racial story, whatever's, whatever's going on here, okay? If we push further still in this conventional narrative, we make our way into the middle decades of the 20th century, now we have the rise of what is becoming known as the third world, gaining voice in the General Assembly, a number of different kinds of conferences, pan-African conferences, racial amity conferences, declarations coming out of the General Assembly. They all signal a change in tenor, an expansion, an inclusiveness that just hadn't been there before. And this is also the moment when we have the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, right, emerging here in the 1960s. Nevertheless, in any version of this conventional historical narrative, 
this moment, this decolonization moment, this self-determination moment, this anti-colonial moment, it's going to fall into desuetude. It's going to run out of steam. It's going to crash on the shores of the 1980s. By the time we're in the 1980s, we now have two fists, right? And they're all neos, right? We have our neo-formalistic rise of international human rights law, and we have our <coughs> neoliberal Washington consensus, strange yet somehow comfortable bedfellows, because they're all neos, right? Joined together in the 80s as we push forward into the moment of globalization that takes us into the 21st century and past 9-11 and those transformations. Okay, so this conventional story leads up to the question that's at the center of my project. At the contemporary moment where this conventional historical narrative ends, and we ask this question, well, what is the problem with race in international law today? Is there, is there a racism problem in international law? Sure, there are racists, but is there a problem for international law that we would call racial or racist or something like that? Because if there is, it seems we already know the answer. And the 1980s crystallized that answer. If there's racism, eliminate it. If there's discrimination, get rid of it. Clearly, it's peripheral. It's marginal. It's weird if we see racism in international law, and we figured that out a long time ago. And so the claim that racism or race or some relation between the two concepts might actually play a central structural or systemic role in the international legal order today is very difficult to articulate. Why? Why is it so difficult to situate its centrality? Well, I don't think it has to do with a lack of interest or a lack of resources or a lack of will. I also don't think it's the work of some secret cabal of evil racist magicians out somewhere either. But what, what is going on, right? When, so James earlier today, when he says, what's going on with this Oxford handbook? on comparative foreign relations law with its 5,000 chapters that's moving across every angle of foreign relations across the world and there's nothing racial about it. Or if you pick up a book on the 27 different ways of thinking about international law today and race isn't anywhere in the table of contents. And they just go on and on, right? It just doesn't appear, why? So my project focuses on a potential answer to that question and it's the idea of racial ideology. So racial ideology in international law is my answer. <clears throat> the one that I'm trying to work up as the answer to that question of what is going on with respect to the difficulties that we encounter in conversations about how to situate race in international law with our colleagues and in the discipline more, more broadly. So I don't have any time in this presentation to dig into what I mean by um, ideology, so I'll just give you my, my working definition here, which is this. I define a racial ideology as a style of naturalizing juridical science in which patterns of argumentative practice at once give structure to indeterminate legal concepts and justify relations of domination through the use of seemingly neutral racial classifications. Okay, so if I start the story over, and now racial ideology is the target, and not the standard of civilization, and we look to the 19th century, and we're asking, well, what was a classic form, a classic style of racial ideology, and what did it do? It starts to orient our gaze in a very different sort of way, and I think uh, what Chris was doing in his presentation this morning was a very similar sort of spirit. When you look at the debates, which were hot and everywhere in the 19th century in race science, international lawyers were generally a part of these conversations. They were all reading the same text. They were citing the same guys. And when you look at, just to take one, one example, take Lhasa Oppenheim's incredibly influential 
schematic of the international legal order that he's writing at the turn of the 20th century with its core of the great powers and the family of nations and then these vassal states and then these you know, regions that were not really anything. They're terra nullius. Basically, it looks just like the typologies that these ethnologists and anthropologists are putting together about the human race. It's the same thing. They map onto each other. Okay, so what? This idea of a classic racial ideology, and here I'll focus in on the, the last uh, remark I want to make, it highlights the importance of a right to exclude, a right to exclude in international law. So what did this right to exclude look like and how is it justified in the classic racial ideology of the 19th century? Sovereigns enjoyed two types of the right to exclude here in the 19th century. The first type was a right to exclude the racially inferior peoples of the world from the community of racial superiors. This is very similar to what the standard civilization is doing, but now we are explicitly calling it a racial marker, a racial boundary. It's sovereigns excluding sovereigns from the international community. The second type is sovereigns having the right to exclude other sovereigns from their territory. If you like, if you're a property kind of person, this kind of tracks the distinction between imperium and dominion. Right? So the sovereign has both kinds of right to exclude here. But what the sovereign does not enjoy in this classic mode of racial ideology is a right to exclude people. It's not there, right? And it's becoming increasingly common in works like Chantal has done and Tendai and others have done, right? Where there just was not a sovereign right to exclude individual migrants, certainly not individual migrants who are coming from other members of the family of nations. But this was not part of the toolkit that the sovereigns enjoy. Okay, so what? The transformation of classic racial ideology in international law to what I call a modern racial ideology, I think is where all the action is in trying to understand where and how racial ideology today does its work in international law. So very quickly, the right to exclude undergoes a transformation as it makes the shift from a classic to a modern structure. The right to exclude that sovereigns had enjoyed at the level of the international community, it's going to weaken, it's gonna give way toward a new, a new ideology of inclusion. It really is, that's gonna happen. But it's a mistake to think that this right to exclude, this racialized right to exclude, because it diminishes there, actually leaves international law, or that it transforms into something else about economic exploitation or about cultural domination. Yes, it does those things, but that racialized right to exclude has not disappeared. It has duplicated itself at a different space in international law. It is now duplicating itself at the borderland between national communities. It is at this moment that the fight is on for a new thing called international migration law. And the fight's gonna get lost. The fight is gonna get lost, why? Because it's right here at the turn in the first couple decades of the 20th century that this new racialized right to exclude is going to have migrated down to the right of sovereigns to exclude people, to exclude migrants. That wasn't there before. And it doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's the same style of naturalizing juridical science, the same style of a racialized right to exclude that duplicates itself here. And so in modern racial ideology in international law, you have a mystification and you have a justification. The mystification is, hey look, racism, we dealt with it. Isn't it more inclusive now? Isn't it expanding? Yeah, sure it is. We did it. When in fact, it simply migrated to this deeper space of the sovereign right to exclude, which is now at the border, at the territorial border, not the border of the international community. The justification is, and this right to exclude is natural. Even though it's being invented out of whole cloth at that very moment, it's natural. Now, for my money, to understand 
to get a grip on. The problem of racism at this level of legal thought in contemporary international law, we not only have to say something or know something, see something about what happened to racial ideology at this crucial moment in the early 20th century, its mystifications, its justifications. More crucially, we have to see how that modern form of racial ideology transformed yet again into the contemporary, the neo-racial ideology that we have now. But that's another story. All right, thank you. Thanks so much to all the panelists, and thank you again to the organizers for enabling us to keep this conversation going. Um, so unlike Michael, who got to sit back, be the uncle who sat back and took a, a, a drag of his cigarette, I'm like the fourth auntie whose house you visited this afternoon, and I'm trying to stuff another piece of halva into your belly. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know that I'm saying anything new, but maybe you'll like my carrot halva. <laughs> um, so, so in particular for this conversation, this transnational legal discourse on race and empire, migration is of course a salient point of study. It is of course inherently transnational, it involves crossing borders, yet there's an interesting chasm that some of us on this panel and in the audience are working on between domestic and international law, similar to the CRT twail gap. As currently performed on the world stage, uh, as my, the panelists have ably shown, um, migration is deeply racialized. And there are, of course, key connections to empire. Um, and Shirali reminds us, importantly, that indigeneity should always be our starting point. Um, and, and though those of us who have uh, studied migration law for some time, are not surprised to, to see both the constitutional order and the international project. We're not surprised to see their seams showing. Perhaps we're taken aback at the ferocity with which it has happened. Um, but, but migration has long highlighted, as Aziz spoke about, the failures of both of these projects to live up to their own myths. So, so let me start by talking a little bit about the agenda of international legal thought with respect to race. Um, like Daryl and others, I really struggled a lot with the slipperiness of the concept of race. I, of course, recognize its importance in this conversation, but, but trying to figure out what exactly it is we're talking about uh, uh, was, was a challenge for me. So I wanted to foreground some of those questions with the hope that we, that we can um, continue the conversation about them. Um, the first question is, of course, the one that, that the halva that Michael already gave you, um, which is what is the work that race is doing in international law, right? That, that, that's, that's an important question. And, and, and one of the points that the panelists raised is that this is structural work, this is not an aberration, that, that's a really important point. Um, and we need to expose both the continuities and discontinuities. I think, I think that's um, one thing that we want to say. Chantal um, lays out very helpfully this idea of race as a technology of domination. Um, in the way that it shapes our conceptions of the world and, and um, race is something we must continually navigate. Um, this, this gives us a sense of the hidden work of ideologies of racial domination um, and, and also keys us into the practical and strategic dimensions. I also want to ask, as Michael did, the, I want to flip the script a little, and, and we need to ask what work is white supremacy doing in international law, right? This is not just about race, this is about um, white supremacy. So of course, my panelists gave all kinds of um, very thoughtful answers. Um, this is about economics, this is about movement. Um, um, Christopher in his paper talked also about the epistemological aspects of this, which I think are really important and, and we could discuss much further the expressive function that law has and the stigma that attaches um, uh, to, to um, to white supremacy and race. And, and, and at the heart, as, as others have said already today, this is about one's ability to govern one's own nation, oneself, one's autonomy, I, I think is at the heart. Um, and, and to take a page from James Baldwin's book, we might ask, what is it about 
white Europeans and the global north that required the construction of race, right? What is it that made them need race? Um, and, and we have some, some helpful I, thoughts around that question, I think. Um, Shirali tells us that race inverts the role of the aggressor um, in a way that's incredibly useful to the violence of the colonial project. Justin tells us that race is a way to enable the functioning of the liberal international legal order. With decolonization, we see border control. And, and, and then I wanted to think a little bit about reading race back in. What work does it do to read race back in? Chantal tells us, I think she didn't get to this in her talk, but, but she gave us a helpful um, um, typology of, of critiques in her paper. Um, and, and I think race is helpful in that it places us in an illegitimate ideological space, right? So, so we can point to um, racial bases for decision making and say, that's illegitimate. And I, I think that's a really helpful tool. Um, Race helps us reject this linear progress narrative, a, a racial lens. So, so asking the race question to take a, 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 um, a, a move um, from the feminist, asking the woman question, asking the race question illuminates. Um, so, so the project then is in part at least to excavate the operation of racial subordination through international law. So, so how do we go about doing this? Um, and, and each of the papers, I think, approaches, each of the papers I might describe as a mapping project and a mapping project of the erasure of race. That's what I really see as the theme that, that works its way through all the papers. Um, so Jennifer and Anil talk about submerging the Constitution um, and about these deliberate strategic choices that avoid race. Um, I also wanted to add, of course, um, that, that, that um, the, um, there's a deliberate erasure of international law in the conversation. Um, and this happened, of course, because of human rights laws promise or threat of racial equality. And, and so that was explicitly written out. And, and I think that's, that, that may be helpful um, to, to the points you were making. And, and so this highlights the importance of reconnecting domestic and international critical race perspectives to respond to this deliberate erasure. We can't, of course, control what the Supreme Court, certainly not this Supreme Court, um, what it sees and doesn't see, but it's still worth engaging around. Chantal helpfully um, talks to us about the obscured role of race in global economic inequality, and, and she um, looks to Tayyab Mahmoud um, to say this is exactly because racialized classifications facilitate legally sanctioned regimes of discipline and control, and that's what it's doing, and, and it's submerged. Shirali talks about the strenuous avoidance of these histories that she tells of white settlement, native elimination, racial subordination and exclusion. She tells us of the separation of using time to separate the colonial past and the ways in which maps obscure these histories uh, and, and, and the histories of the imperialism of free trade, the exercise of economic and military power and violence. Justin engages with the slippery concept and talks to us about the shifting of the work of racial ideology and international law from colonialism to borders and economic development. Um, he talks about the idea of sovereignty as universal and race as the technology through which it's applied to non-white people. So stepping away, as he says, from this classic racial ideology to the nation, we have to understand how this classic mode modernized to grasp the centrality of international law's race problem. As he just told us, sovereignty is premised on the right to exclude individuals and so, so in order to uphold this myth of sovereign equality um, and this fear of international migration law requiring states to open their borders, which is found in the, in the um, travel preparatoire of the, of the treaties, um, th this concern about being required to open your borders um, even to those fleeing serious violence. Um, so this, he, he talks about his neos, right? Neoliberalism, neoformalism of rights and postmodernism, um, and, and this, this new utopia of human rights that enabled the rejection of calls for programmatic higher order social justice. So taking us away from these structural critiques um, and, and the need to move back 
to the structural critiques. And of course, with this shift, um, as we see um, with migration, nationality can be used to obscure the race question. So it's important to bring back the race question and say, this is not just about nationality. This is not just about cultural difference. Um, this is about race because of the illegitimacy um, that, that it lends um, the, the, it lends support to our argument. The, the, a couple of the, uh, the panelists also talk about this, this new visibility of, of white nationalism um, and, and the new urgency to critique it. I, I of course, agree to some extent. I, I guess to some extent, I think it's always been urgent. Um, but, but I will say, for those of you who have, have not been um, uh, subject to the, uh, the the firestorm in your inbox <laughs> of, of the immigration law scholars, there is, as we've been sitting here today, a new Muslim ban has been implemented, um, now banning nationals of six more countries, Burma, Eritrea, Kyrgyzstan, Nigeria, Sudan, and Tanzania for immigrant, for non-immigrant, and Anil tells me, immigrant visas. So this is indeed urgent, it's happening as we speak all the time. It's impossible to open your inbox and not find a piece of horror in there. Um, and, and, and they also talk about the liberal response, um, which is basically to join the restrictionists. Um, so, so the importance of foregrounding race, again, um, to question that, uh, that, that move. Um, and because, I, I also wanna raise the point that because white national nationalist ideology travels so effectively, our response has to be transnational. So, so there has to be this joining of the domestic and the international in order to respond effectively. So Shirali asks, how do we unsettle these borders? Um, and, and, and Neil and Jen also talk about the particular role of law in reifying settled disputes regardless of their accuracy. So thinking about law in that way and the way it settles um, race questions uh, the, the importance of pushing back. Um, I think all of the panelists point to the importance of a response that ties history to the present, right? That, that, that um, opens up empire and economics, as Chantal does, settler colonialism, as Shirali does, and race through culture and nationality, as Justin does. White supremacy has deep roots domestically and internationally, and, and it's inextricably linked to the movement of people because the movement of people both enables and threatens white control. Um, so so uh, being mindful of the, the instability of border imperialism, this is an important place to do the work. So I'm just gonna close with a couple of thoughts. The first one about, of course, the challenges, right? This is, this is still a conversation about bringing CRT and TWAIL together, and, and there are challenges. Um, so, so first of all, to centering race in TWAIL scholarship, um, this, this is a, a, a move that's going to require um, a lot of minds uh, to work on. Um, and, and to have a transnational approach that theorizes race and empire within, through, and across national borders and and it where are the shortcomings of CRT in capturing these global dynamics? There's little about race in international law, as many folks have said today, even in TWAIL. But these mapping projects begin to show us ways um, that we might begin to meet these challenges. Um, so I guess I'll leave you with, with a, a couple of final thoughts. Um, uh, first of all, the point that, that Asla and Tendai have both made in their paper and by bringing us together is the importance of building intellectual community around this research agenda. And I think the real thirst for this space that we saw in March and we see now that it's so important to open up this space to have these conversations and to keep having these conversations. Um, as Shirali says it, at the very end of her paper, thinking about our shared capacity to imagine our way beyond the enclosures of the present and, and to think about what is in closing us. And I think the papers talk about erasure um, and historical amnesia. And, and while we're doing this, to of course be mindful of the voices um, that, 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 that we're, we're putting forward, um, in particular being mindful of including the voices of newer scholars um, in this group, and also to of course um, the many subjects of international law who don't have the same platform that we do um, from which to express our thoughts to, to, to um, do what we can uh, to bring their voices forward as well. Thank you.